press, press and roll. And um, it looks a little different for me because I'm already enrolled. Uh, but if I press enroll, let's see if it'll do it. Yeah, so you can create an account. Um, just ask for basic information. It is a free account. Um, there's no cost to you. Um, it's about 120 days of access and you can request extensions. It's a developer cloud. It's not like a monetized uh, cloud. It's to be able to develop with um, Intel tools on Intel hardware that are in the cloud. So you'll just fill out your basic uh, contact information. You'll fill out uh, a little bit more about you um, to show you a little bit about that. So if you were to um, go there and sign and roll and in that uh, application, just make sure that you choose uh, AI inference. That's important. You can choose all three and that gets you uh, access to all of the dev cloud. Uh, and there's a lot more than what we're going to go over today. Um, but uh, check out the, um, you know, make sure you check on the AI inference. So good time to do that. <clears throat> so again, you have a few more minutes uh, to get going. If anybody has any questions too right now, um, feel free to ask me. Um, generally how we're gonna do this is uh, right now, Absolutely fine. Take yourself on mute and, and ask me the question. But once we start, what I'd like you to do is either you can submit uh, a question to the chat and the moderators will prompt me, um, or you can raise your hand and then the moderator will prompt you uh, to then uh, you know, ask your question if you want to take yourself off mute then as well. And just as a reminder, um, this is an interactive webinar, um, just to like a follow along where, you know, we're doing this virtually. So it's, uh, it's maybe it introduces some more challenges than if we were sort of in person walking around and, you know, able to, to meet face to face. But given the, um, the constraints right now, we have to do these things virtually. So um, I want you to follow along in the dev cloud and I'll help you navigate through and explain what DevCloud is, but go to devcloud.intel.com and press enroll and fill out the application and be sure to choose uh, AI inference. That's important. You can register with any email account. Uh, it's free to access. It's 120 days of access and then you can request extensions. It's, it's a developer cloud, so it's not um, a system that requires like credits to pay for, or, or there's no credit card information you ever have to put in or something like that. How are we doing on participants, um, Elena? Looks like we have, well, minus Rihanna and I, we have 24. Okay. Yeah. So we're getting up there. Maybe we'll take a poll right now, just generally. Um, if you have a DevCloud account, uh, could you comment maybe in the in the chat to say, I have a DevCloud account? Let's see how those chats look. Thank you, Sophia. <laughs> oh, it looks okay, like we have a great. Yes, I just made one. Great. Oh, this is music to my ears. Thank you. Let's give it a few more minutes for those of you. So just as a reminder of just to whom is this workshop is I'm a student pursuing passion. Um, Yes, this is a good um, workshop for you. It's a workshop for students uh, generally um, to expose you to uh, a form of AI. Um, and uh, 
you know, if, if you're pursuing a computer science degree in particular, but even if you're pursuing, say, a marketing degree, AI is really, you know, it being infused to so many um, products and solutions and, and uh, uh, SaaS services uh, that to know about AI is really um, important to even be able to sort of articulate how AI works. And, and so it's, it's a great workshop for students. Is anybody having trouble enrolling for DevCloud? Well, that's a good sign. No one's having trouble. I didn't hear that. Yeah, so um, about how many participants do you think we have now? Let me look. Let's see. Um, looks like we've got a couple, so 26. Okay. Yeah, 28. Yeah, I was just counting out Rihanna and I. <laughs> okay. Uh, just as a last reminder, so there's a workshop. It, it's interactive. I just want you to follow along because it's a virtual workshop. Um, to register for DevCloud, just go to devcloud.intel.com and press enroll. You'll fill out an application uh, and uh, just basic information about you, and uh, you'll get to a part where um, it asks more about you. What's the purpose you want to use DevCloud for? And you can check all three of these, but make sure that you check the AI inference box. It's important. It's 120 days of access, completely free. You can request extensions. Um, it's a developer cloud. Um, with access to, to Intel software technologies um, connected to Intel hardware in a cloud um, to learn and um, to develop on and then ultimately deploy. Um, it's not like a cloud, like a monetized cloud, like an AWS, uh, Microsoft. Um, just to answer the question I had in the last workshop that I hosted, um, we're doing five of these. They're all identical. So you can attend as many as you want, but they're really going to be identical. But I had a question about you know what's the difference between the Intel Dev Cloud and say uh, a Microsoft Azure or you know an AWS uh, cloud? Those clouds are um, their purposes. I would say both development and production. Um, so they they are are essentially an infrastructure as a service, software as a service for companies um, to host uh, equipment. So uh, they can. Um, they're, you know, typically charging um, credit, um, you know, cloud credits uh, to be able to access and do things on the cloud. We are not, it's our, our cloud is, is a specifically a developer cloud is why it's called dev cloud. And it's really to broaden access to Intel software technologies and Intel um, hardware, you know, combined. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining today. I'm Jay Burris, I'm an ac the academic program manager for our toolkit called OpenVINO. It stands for Open Visual Inference Neural Network Optimization. It's an AI toolkit, so it's a number of tools in a kit. And I work in the Internet of Things group. Um, I have today Elena and Rihanna. Um, from our agency, Be My App, helping with uh, being moderators. And I just want to give a shout out to them. Thank you uh, for being here today. They're going to monitor um, the chat and sort of help mon uh, moderate this. Um, if you want to communicate with us uh, during the workshop, you can do so in two ways. Um, so you can submit your questions in the chat and the moderators are going to prompt me uh, with your question, or you can raise your hand with the little uh, raise hand emoticon, uh, and then they will um, prompt you to, you know, when it's, it's a, a good time to take yourself off mute mm -hmm. and, and verbally ask your question, if you prefer to verbally ask your question. And I am fine with both ways. Um, so this is, this is interactive. Notices and disclaimers, um, we are recording uh, this uh, webinar, so um, we're just required to notify everybody who's participating about recording. And today's agenda, we're going to go over um, 
three tutorials in the dev cloud. So we're going to teach you a little bit about OpenCV, which is um, Open Computer Vision Library. It's a little bit like uh, Adobe Photoshop on steroids. Um, we're also going to uh, go over an AI classification Jupyter Notebook and teach you how, um, you know, what sort of the, the concept of classification as well as how the notebook is structured and the coding. And we'll go over an AI object detection uh, Jupyter Notebook as well. So it builds on what you learn. So first you learn a bit about, um, quite a bit about OpenCV, but then there's a portion of OpenCV that we uh, demonstrate in the classification Jupyter Notebook. And then the object detection uh, Ju Jupyter Notebook, we uh, um, build on it by also showing you the power of the dev cloud and, and, and access to all the hardware and how to benchmark. So we'll talk about how, you know, computer vision is revolutionizing industries. Um, it's everywhere. Um, and it's already in our homes. You might have even a, um, a, uh, a smart doorbell, for example. But AI is in our homes with, say, uh, natural language processing and, uh, from, uh, you know, Alexa devices or, or Google Home hubs and so forth. Um, We'll talk about an example, um, smart cities, which encompasses a lot of different use cases, uh, say, such as transportation, utilities, public services, infrastructure and buildings. Um, we'll describe the differences between, say, com traditional computer vision versus AI enabled. Um, and then we'll give you an overview of the dev cloud, help you get navigated in that, um, understand how to use it, and, and then uh, an overview of the Intel distribution of OpenVINO toolkit. If it's possible, if we could go on mute. Um, we might mute you from time to time. Um, if you're unmuted, uh, just so that we manage the, the background noise. Um, but then again, like if you wanna um, go off of me, just raise your hand and, and you can ask your question. Um, we'll go over the workflow, the API workflow, because this is about learning a bit about um, the API suite of OpenVINO and how it works and the practical examples. And then also we'll help you through um, GitHub. We have um, resources available out on GitHub uh, that you can actually download and install OpenVINO locally. Again, it's uh, participatory, so I want you to follow along in DevCloud. Um, join the DevCloud at devcloud.intel.com, press that enroll button, and as you're filling out the application, make sure that you choose AI inference, but you can choose all three. So who is Intel? Um, it may seem like an obvious question. Intel is known to a lot of people, but you know what we're trying to do is really create world-changing technologies. Um, so we want to improve the life of every human on the planet. And tech has never been more important to humanity. Um, we're now at basically 100 billion connected devices um, offering distributed intelligence. And you can see how we've grown up over the years, you know, digitizing everything in 1980s to networking everything, um, to mobile everything, uh, then cloud. And now it's, it's really about um, expanding at the edge. Um, and OpenVINO was designed to essentially deploy AI inference at the edge so that we can uh, do more at the edge without having to rely on a cloud, have immediate results, um, transfer less data over network pipelines. And there are use cases that really um, require uh, immediate insights. The world creates 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every single day and only a, a fraction of it's utilized. So that's a huge potential of unprocessed data. I read somewhere that like uh, even a, a jet engine is, is producing terabytes of data um, with every flight. Uh, and a lot of it is unconsumed. Um, it's sort of stored. It may have to be analyzed later for, for um, you know, reasons to, to determine how well um, the engine is uh, performing, but some of it needs to be processed immediately. And that needs to be done with immediate insights. So at Intel, we're really powering this digital disruption in four ways. The cloud, um, Intel supplies Xeon hardware, um, 
lots of, of um, other additional components, um, storage, uh, networking, to be able to en- enable our cloud customers. And our cloud customers are the big you know, cloud service providers um, that I mentioned that you know, we're not competing with them in terms of our dev cloud. Um, uh, they're offering a service that is enabled uh, by Intel technology. Um, we're also a leader in uh, 5G uh, network technology. So we're really uh, deploying this through partners, uh, um, the telcos uh, and TEMS. So uh, anywhere from say like your Ericsson's uh, and Rakuten and many others who are standing up the infrastructure to be able to allow the Verizons and the AT&Ts and the BTs and so forth to be able to provide the, the network service that we all use every day from our phones. We're powering also um, the uh, artificial intelligence um, aspects. Um, and as we get through this, you'll see the, the scope of how AI can be deployed with Intel on virtually any uh, chipset that Intel produces. And I, in particular, am working in an organization called the uh, Internet of Things Group, um, really focused on the intelligent edge, so bringing that um, awareness, uh, that capability, that inference to be able to be deployed right at the edge and for immediate insights. So let's talk a little bit about the dev cloud and how it works. Uh, and then we'll um, get into, um, sorry, I'll jump over to the dev cloud. But so a, it, it's a developer cloud environment. Um, and it's so it's instant AI inference lab for your project. So there's no fees, there's no budget. There's no shipping, setup, maintenance, or upgrade expense required on your behalf. And if there's any faculty members on this um, webinar today, um, that's particularly important. We have so much hardware in the cloud, in this dev cloud, that uh, no one institution could replicate it, you know, because it would just be such a huge expense to do that. Plus, we always have the latest version, uh, and actually you um, one or two versions behind accessible of OpenVINO uh, install in the dev cloud. So you don't have to do the install of OpenVINO in the dev cloud for this development purposes. We have Jupyter Notebooks in here so you can learn from tutorials, which is what we're going to do today. And we also have real world sample applications. Um, you can prototype in, in the dev cloud so you can upload your own data sets. You can upload your own images or your own videos, um, which a video is really just a string of frames of images and you get up to 50 gigs of private storage space and you can code there so you can upload and you can download back to when you're ready, you think you're done and you wanna test it on an edge device. Um, and you can also benchmark your customized um, applications uh, to see how they compare. So let's go through the how it works sort of diagram. So number one is would be you, you're logging in just through a, a web portal, devcloud.intel.com and you immediately jump into development servers uh, that offer a Jupyter Lab experience. It's where the, the Jupyter Notebooks live. Um, and there's also several other tools that are enabled, uh, available to you, some of which we won't go over today in this workshop, it would take more time. Um, but you can upload your own data sets in your own video and that's provided in the storage. Um, then in your storage, uh, you can do your own development of your own code and then you can execute your code uh, to uh, edge devices. There's actually several labs in the world that have these um, pieces of edge equipment um, running different SKUs of CPUs uh, and of integrated GPUs and what we call a VPU or a vision processor unit. Um, you might've heard the of the uh, Intel Neural Compute Stick too. Um, that little blue stick um, has the Intel Movidius Myriad X chipset in it. Well, we also offer that in other form factors, um, what we call sort of um, high density deep learning HDDL um, devices. They're like daughter add-in cards that uh, you could plug into PCIe, mini PC- PCIe, M.2 form factors with from one from one to eight um, chipsets on them. And what we do is is we, we, we productize those through partners and you could actually build a, a maybe a, like a service system or even a, um, a desktop system um, where you had an Intel CPU and then you have the, the PCI Express slots and you could plug in those out of cards with uh, those uh, Movidius um, ASICs on them 
and add extra uh, performance, uh, extra AI compute power. And so you can offload um, uh, some of your application function uh, to the VPU. Uh, and then, so that covers sort of four, so you can execute those and you can benchmark the results, the comparison. Um, so that gets you the results in the telemetry in the dashboard. Um, you can also um, source of where you want to find particular equipment through our partners in our dev cloud. And finally, you can, you know, can see the, the video inference uh, and the Im image output as well. Um, and in the dev cloud, we have lots of different sample applications by vertical. We're going to post mostly focus on the tutorials today, but I'll show you where to find the sample applications. But these are real world sample applications that help you um, uh, understand and art it articulates how uh, to build in um, the open vino inference into an application for things like safety, healthcare, retail, industrial, uh, and then of course the three at the bottom, public sector, smart cities, and in general. So lots of different um, use cases. So like for example, in safety, you might want to deploy an application that detects um, whether somebody coming into a building or into an area of a factory is wearing their safety gear. Are they wearing their helmet, their goggles? Um, maybe it's the, it's like the, the bright orange uh, vest that the uh, woman is wearing in the image. Um, this was actually redeployed in some ways um, during COVID to detect whether somebody was wearing a mask or not. Um, in healthcare, uh, we have use cases on pneumonia detection and, and brain tumor segmentation, um, really using uh, computer vision and analyzing uh, uh, images of say an, an X-ray, um, whereas the human eye can only just detect so much um, AI has gotten so much better than what the human eye can detect and what what uh, radiologists have been trained for years to be able to read um, a, an X-ray and identify things. AI can now do a lot more to help them um, process quicker and um, results uh, sooner, as well as uh, more targeted and essentially diagnose earlier on if say a patient has cancer and be able to treat them in ways like maybe with medication rather than um, drastic surgery. In the retail use case, uh, you might see where um, computer vision is deployed to identify with it says traffic monitoring or aisle monitoring. Uh, you might, a, a, a company might want to identify the traffic patterns in their stores to be able to better optimize where to locate uh, different products um, to increase sales, uh, for instance. Um, industrial um, can be used in a lot of ways to detect um, defects uh, in a production line earlier rather than having to, to wait until the full material is produced and then tested and then find out that a whole batch has been wasted. So let's jump over to the dev cloud. So again, go to devcloud.intel.com and I'm already signed in. So here you get at the front end of the dev cloud and the Dev Cloud is for a number of tools that Intel has. We have our, our one API suite of tools um, for code development, um, for uh, more machine learning, uh, data science aspects. We're not gonna cover that today. The purpose we're covering today in this workshop is the OpenVINO Toolkit. It's the AI um, Neural uh, Network Inference Toolkit. So go in here. And so if you're logged in, follow me along and go into um, that OpenVINO side. And now here at the home page, you'll find information about the latest announcements. Um, we generally update this. Um, with OpenVINO, we, we usually release about four times a year. Um, and one of those is a long-term support release, um, but uh, it's always updated um, with the latest version that we make available. And you can, you know, this this homepage tells you a bit about how you can learn and then build, optimize, and launch. Um, but something down here that's kind of interesting is we have a lot of different hardware. This is physical hardware in several labs worldwide that are accessible to you. And through the, the, the job queue, you can execute applications to. Um, you can see we have a number of um, uh, types of CPUs in there. Uh, with integrated GPUs. Um, in the future, we hope to have uh, discrete GPUs as well, as well as where Intel's really just releasing um, Intel Arc GPUs now. 
uh, accelerators. These would be those um, uh, additional uh, ASICs. We also have FPGA, so uh, field programmable gate arrays um, in here. And if you clicked on this link to see all the hardware configurations, in here it describes about edge nodes and edge nodes groupings. Um, this is kind of how you, um, when we get to the object detection Jupyter Notebook, it'll make a lot more sense, but it's it's really how you execute code to a particular job queue or multiples of them at one time and then benchmark. And so um, you can see we have, uh, you know, Intel offers a range of, of um, compute. At the top of our stack um, is Intel Xeon. Uh, a little bit below that is our our core brand. So you have Intel Core i9, i7, i5, i3. Um, some Xeon processors have integrated graphics. Almost all core um, uh, products have integrated graphics because those are typically deployed in desktops and um, servers. And then if I expand it. Uh, you can see uh, an even longer list uh, keeps going down. We have Atom, which is the low core, so the more value um, range of Intel CPU. Um, and then the list of Xeons as well. And we have a number of uh, neural compute sticks plugged in and our HCDL cards as well. And so you can see the inference accelerator. So none here on this first row, but for instance, here on this row, um, we have a um, a VPU card um, with eight um, uh, VPUs. Okay, so then I'm going to go and also show you a little bit about this build tab. So on the build tab, um, there's a couple of things to uh, you'll be able to find. So developer documentation, um, if you're looking to find out how to navigate um, Jupyter the Jupyter environment, you can do so here, uh, reading documentation, um, how to run your code, how to manage jobs, and then additional documentation as well. Also, you can see how um, there's a link here to extend access, but that's also at the top of the um, homepage. A um, little bit about other things that we offer. Um, we're not gonna go over today much, but um, Edge for Industrial is a, is a, a fuller featured um, software stack for industrial use cases, which embeds um, OpenVINO and, and inference into it, as well as being able to manage all the data. And then OpenVINO um, supports a number of frameworks. So you might have heard of framework libraries for AI like TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, Onyx, um, which stands for Open Neural Network Exchange. And we'll go back through the slides and, and show you and explain some of that. But TensorFlow is, is a hugely popular framework as well as PyTorch. Um, the TensorFlow, we've worked with um, the TensorFlow organization and uh, we have integrated uh, OpenVINO to work with this and there's ways to, to use OpenVINO and your standard TensorFlow models, um, just adding two lines of code uh, to accelerate. So now let's get started into on the learn tab. Um, now there's two sections here. Tutorials are sort of um, more starty tutorials. It's where we're gonna spend most of our time today. Sample ap applications are the real world sample applications uh, I described a few minutes ago on the slide. Um, and then of course you can see the overview here uh, below. So I'm gonna briefly jump into sample applications to show you so it makes it real and you can see uh, all the different sample applications that are available. Um, so we've got featured uh, applications uh, for robotic surgery, segmentation, um, safety gear. Uh, and so there's this whole collection of sample applications that you can check out. And you really just have to click on the link um, on one of them to open up the Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to go back and go to tutorials. And now's a great time to get started. So go to learn and go to tutorials. And I'm going to give you a moment. And we're going to um, eventually open this open CV tutorial. But you can see there's tutorials in here on how to migrate um, to the dev cloud, so meaning uploading um, your 
code, if you have pre-developed code, uploading your data sets, uploading your um, video streams or um, your images. And then of course, there's the corresponding migrate to the edge as well. There's um, some additional ones like benchmark your app. Um, we're gonna go over the classification tutorial um, as well after the open CV tutorial. And then post training optimization tool is a tool that allows you to, um, without having to retrain your model, it allows you to essentially um, shrink your model, uh, if you will, to maybe a smaller form um, to be able to uh, run it faster. And the reason why that might be important is a lot of models may be developed in, in what's called floating point 32 size. Um, some architectures require um, floating point 16. Some architectures require int 8. Um, it's about sort of having smaller models for the size of the footprint of the device and how much performance that device uh, can offer you based on its constraints of, of you know, how, how big it is, uh, how much power it can consume, where it's located and so forth. So I'm going to go back up here and I'm going to go open the open CV tutorial and I am going to pause here, um, give you a moment to do so the same and see, are there any questions? Um, right um, now? Dr. Bowman Jay, there are no questions so far. Okay. Is anybody having any trouble? Is anybody familiar with OpenCV? We got one person saying they are familiar. Okay. Gives me one time to. They're not. Sorry, Jay. That's okay. Okay. Well, this is good. So, <clears throat> I'm I'm just curious. Are um, if if you're a student, maybe you know, put in the chat. I'm a student. Which is like you know curious of, of people should or if you're a faculty member um like to know and it's okay if you're neither um if you if you join this um follow along and you could you know we'd love to hear um what looks you like we have quite a few students awesome okay great well um i'll also you know maybe say up front it's okay to also ask me you know questions about anything else um, i'll try to answer them um you, you know you could ask me what it's like to work at intel what it's like to work in technology um you know i i'm happy to to ask questions we could also we'll just do a, a bit of q a at the end um, okay so open cv you can see here it stands for open source computer vision library uh, like i said it's sort of like Adobe Photoshop on steroids, um, but for command line, it's for applications. It's for building it into um, to be able to manipulate photos and images um, in in sort of applications rather than sort of like a consumer led. You know, Adobe is is very um, you know GUI oriented um, tool so that you can uh, navigate and and edit photos or or videos. Um, so. Jay, really quick, we do have a question. Um, someone was wondering if we could show again how to redirect to the Jupyter Lab page. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll close this down. Um, so from DevCloud, go to the Learn tab, and then go to Tutorials. And then you'll see the open CV tutorial. Okay. Now, Jupyter notebooks are, are fantastic for learning um, because they're they're you know narrative written sort of book form, um, which you can read and follow along, and then that all is, surrounds uh, executable code. So there's executable executable code blocks um, in good Jupyter notebooks really to, to learn. And that's what we're going through today. 
the reason why it's pre-developed and we're going through this um, rather than me typing it out and, and 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 doing the coding is it would just take so much time for me to type it out and maybe you know make mistakes as I type and and so forth. Um, so you can see how it will walk you through some of the you know the prerequisites. Um, it's good to have um, some Python language experience. We have samples for both C. Uh, C++ and Python. Um, in here, you can see typically that all the files are going to be available to you um, on the left nav pane. Um, also, and that you find that by hitting this little file icon. Um, this shows you sort of like a um, an outline of the Jupyter Notebook and all of what we'll cover. But, um, and this Jupyter Notebook, uh, doesn't require a whole lot of files. Our second and third one will require more files and you'll see them there. Um, you can upload um, files on your own by using this little upload button. You could add a, uh, a, a new folder yourself um, in your own Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so there's a number of libraries also that are needed. Um, as a part of, of OpenCV. So we've got the OpenCV Python library, the NumPy, which is a math library. Um, essentially, it, it's the library that helps you build um, uh, arrays. And then the matplotlib uh, allows you to add sort of that, um, the math functions, um, extra visualization. So in this tutorial, um, what we're going to show you is sort of, you know, creating initializing storage for images, accessing um, both the data and the attributes, um, reading in, displaying, and writing out um, images and video. You can convert color space. You can change the dimensions. Uh, you can split and merge images, and you can um, concatenate images. And why that's important is there's there's not really one single standard um, for um, for AI models uh, that are built. It all kind of depends on the the architect of the model, the data scientist who built the AI model. Um, and they might have specified, say, that it needs to be RGB versus BRG. Um, or they might have, you know, it says that the image needs to be in a very specific size, like width and height. And so you may want to do inference on images and you may have to, you know, resize those images um, to be able to, uh, to uh, run the inference on them accurately. So the NumPy and, and um, OpenCV in terms of, of storing data like this, I was just mentioning. So there's, you know, there's a the width and the height to, to take into account. Um, you can have images of color and you can have images of grayscale. There's something important. These are channels. So this concept of channels as well comes into play in, in computer vision AI. So RGB or it could be ordered in BRG, depending on what the model specifies. Um, now, you'll build an array, uh, and so for in this example, I haven't gotten to any section of code yet. It's a little bit further down, but this is sort of an example of you know height, width, and channels. So um, two by four by three, and you build an array um, to essentially put those pixels into uh, the array. Now with matplotlib you may want to be, or you'll use this to, to do the image displaying, we say uh, the IM show or M show um, function. So, you know, M show ex expects the, the input um, to be in, in BRG channel order typically. Um, and then you, you wanna import uh, several libraries. Um, so as you're building up an application and this become a little bit repetitious to you, but it's about reinforcing this and seeing it over and over again helps to reinforce this. You want to import the CV2 library. You want to import the NumPy library. Typically, we do that as just the shortened uh, NP and also the matplotlib uh, pyplot as plot. Now, it's important to initialize your storage. And you can do so in a number of ways. Um, you may want to initialize your storage as empty. Um, you may want to initialize as full um, or zeros or ones um, so that you start out with a known of, of, of what's in your um, matrix of, of um, pixels for that image before you fill it up so that you don't have any um, 
any sort of artifacts left over, maybe from um, some some previous image that you stored uh, in there. So you can also empty it um, with the function. Uh, so like new array, empty in the data type. And here is our first section of code. So you can click on that and you can hit the run button. And now what this did was you imported NumPy. So you create uh, a three-dimensional array, four by four by three. So you created it as empty, as empty. MP, sorry, M MP dot empty at four by four by three. And this one was initialized with data type of, of int eight. And then print the array. So with the print and the image RGB. And so you can see uh, what was filled in um, here. And then you may want to initialize this as full. And very similarly, uh, you can choose full and we'll run this bit of code. So we filled it as full as with 128. So everything gets filled with 128. And off the top of my head, I don't know what color code that um, corresponds to. Uh, you can do so with zeros. So with the zero function, very simply, a very similar, you know, MP zeros, uh, and everything got filled in with zeros in the four by four by three matrix, and with ones. It's pretty obvious. Okay, now accessing image data type is done through, um, uh, for example, you want to uh, read a pixel, so. And then you can read the pixel and the image and then write the pixel. So let's go down to code example, which best articulates it and see what's going on. So again, standard, we're importing NumPy. Then we're creating an array of two by four by three. We're filling it with zeros. Um, we're gonna write to the pixel and then uh, the image here. Uh, then we're gonna do some print, print statements. So um, You'll see after we write it. And so there you can see how uh, it was first initialized as zero, and then it was filled in with the 11, 22, and 33. And there was a modification made. So you know, adding a one, and so you can see after the write and the print statements of what it produced, 12, 23, 34. So then accessing uh, image attributes. So this is where you might want to, um, you know, return the number of dimensions in the array. So you don't, you know, don't necessarily know what's in the array or you want to return the shape and want to return the total size. Uh, and the data for it. So this is about the attributes, not necessarily about the data within the array. So we'll run this bit of code so you can see what it looks like. Uh, but again, we created a, an array, um, filled it with zeros and a data type of int8. Um, and really, we're, we're not displaying the array, we're displaying the attributes. So the image number of dimensions, um, three, the image shape, two by three by four, and the size, and the data type. All right. Now, <clears throat> reading and displaying and writing an image and a video are very similar. Remember, a, a video is really, in some ways, it's just a, a set of frames, a set of images strung together. So if you want to read from disk, um, so you might want to read out um, what that is. Um, again, you'll import the CV2 library, and then you'll use the IM read function and the file name. Let's go to the code. Okay, so we read in um, a file called cat.jpg, which is uh, somewhere over here in this. Uh, let's see if we can find it. 
um, somewhere over in the files here. So uh, what this told us is that it's a, of dimension three, um, the shape, the size, and the uh, intake uh, data type. And now I am show, you want to actually show the image. So it's with CV2 dot I am show uh, a window name and the image array. And the window name is the name used to identify the window. Uh, so here with a bit of code, you can see, you know, you want to display. So I am show um, and, and we should get down to. Sorry. Let's keep this bit of code. Okay. So here's the cat image. Um, and so the example of what we did in this particular code. So we read in the cat image, uh, and you know we're going to plot the image essentially, um, and we're also going to um, plot the title. And so you can see um, how the image uh, portrayed and the image uh, with a color conversion uh, later on. Now, if you want to write the image back to disk, it's just with the I am write. So I am read is to read from disk, I am write. Uh, so image write and image read are the two functions. Okay, so now why did we print an image of um, four bars, um, you know, blue, green, red, and gray? So let's examine this bit of code. So um, we are setting an image file name to, to I am right. Um, and you can see that we had already previously imported our libraries. So we set the image width to 256 and the height to 128. And we divided uh, by four, essentially, to so have those four columns. And then we filled in the, you know, we did an empty first. We filled in with 128, so that's blue, back to the previous ones, it's blue. Um, then green is uh, 0, 128, 0. Red is 0, 0, 128. And then gray is all 128s. And we wrote that image, and we read the image, and then we plotted the image with I am show, and you can see how it ended up plotting. So in some ways that was really creating an image on the fly with pixels and then just, just uh, reading, it, reading it out and displaying it. So I'm gonna take a sip of water and see, are there any questions? I'm not seeing any questions at the moment, but we can give it a second. Maybe something will come in. It gets far more interesting. That's all. This is all quite basic at this moment, um, but it's important to to reinforce this point so you understand how to how to um, uh, navigate. Um, when I show you how uh, neural networks are structured and how they depend on certain formats um, for images. So now we get into a bit more interesting use case. So video capture. You may have uh, a use case where you want to uh, do video capture from say two cameras and disk. Uh, you may want to build that up and you can use that with the video capture function. So you'll create the video capture object for your, your video stream. Um, you use the uh, IS opened function, you know, to check the video stream is opened and it's ready um, to be read. Uh, you use the read function and then you'll use the release to release the video stream in the object. So you can see in this bit of code, you import the CV2 library, you set video into the, the CV2 dot video capture, specifying your, your video source. Um, then you'll read in frames over and over again until the end uh, or until an error. So with is opened, um, you'll break if there's an error um, so that you won't have a you know, sort of an infinite loop um, just waiting. 
uh, and then you'll process uh, and display, et cetera, uh, the image. Jay, we have a question here. Um, someone was just wondering if we can share the links of where we can learn about OpenVINO and all the available source resources. Yep. Um, so if you were to Google um, Intel OpenVINO, frankly, you might just be able to Google OpenVINO. Here at the OpenVINO toolkit, um, you can find there's a number of ways to download and install, but we're going to go over the GitHub Jupyter Notebooks, which is kind of the easiest way to get um, started. That'll be sort of in the third half or third um, quarter of this uh, webinar. How it works, um, talks, explanation of use cases, there's tutorials, there's documentation, and so forth. And we will make sure that um, we're going to send out um, the slides because the slides have lots of links um, uh, and available information that could be useful to you. So again, I mentioned that OP OpenCV's native um, channel order is BRG, not RGB, but some models have specified RGB. So depending on your image, you might have to switch it back to BRG. down here to the code. Okay. So what's going on in this code? So, you know, first you begin specifying your video and your Jupyter Notebook. Um, you might want to delete it, re-import it, set up your uh, matplotlib um, pyplot. Um, uh, then uh, you might want to have your your input video file name. You know, you're going to specify it. In this case, it's uh, cars. We have a, a MP4 um, set up in the files um, for this. Then um, you'll do the video capture um, with the cv2.video capture, and you'll read in um, frame by frame, so is opened. I keep getting this error for some reason. I might need to restart my Jupyter Notebook. See if it ran. Did not. While you're doing that, Jay, we do have another question. Um, what is the difference between BRG and RGB models? Sure. Um, let me uh, just get this opened up again. No problem. So um, BRG, um, blue, blue, red, green, and um, RGB, red, green, blue, it's the order in which those channels um, are set. So I hope that helps answer it. So like this is sort of an image of an RGB. If it was BRG, the, the blue and the red would be swapped. And it's how they're plotted in the essentially in the matrix of you know of the, the data. Because remember, computers runs on 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 um, you know, we process these things by pixels and they run ones and zeros. Um, and we've set essentially um, corresponding value numbers um, for a particular uh, you know, color uh, rate. Let me try to go back down. And... This. I apologize, this Jupyter Notebook is not running. Let's see if this one will. Okay, that got it going.
apologize. Let me just root cause this here a bit. It looks like on the per, um, on the participant side, we did have someone say they're facing the same issue. Yeah. Okay, so that wrote, that part worked. Well, let's just do our best. Um, so where were we? Find where I was. So I was going over this, uh, I think the video writer section or me. I was going over this section um, with multiple streams. And so, you know, video capture is open. Make sure that your, you know, your video stream is open ready read and then release so we went over that bit of code and this is the jupyter notebook that was giving us fits okay oh it looks like it did run um so what this code was doing was ultimately it read in, and it says the number of frames that were read in so 21 um, now to go back, we have this car um, uh, this video where we'll actually show you this video, uh, later on in a, another Jupyter notebook, so you can see what it looks like, but, um, we read in the video and then we read frame by frame. So we read in video and read, um, over and over again, um, break, uh, and then essentially we wanted to read out if the frames greater than 20 plus one uh, break that's the point at which we break and then we printed the number of frames read so we read in with this code 21 frames um, plus the one 20 frames plus the one and then we released so video and release right at the very end now you want to write a video stream to disk. Uh, so you might have a video stream coming in from a camera. So you you want to create the video writer. So the object for writing the stream of video, then do is open function to check that the video stream is open and ready to write, write and then release. That's so the reverse order instead of read is write. So um, with your library, importing your library again, your video out. Um, will be set to video writer, um, the file, um, the frames per second, the video width and height and the color. And I, this bit of uh, text explains um, what those attributes are about. And now, so in, in the code, you're going to video write the writer, like I said, uh, the output file name um, is opened just to check and make sure uh, and confirm else if failed to open and set up um, for your output file uh, and then release. And so this is writing this very similar. Um, again, setting up this image, these four um, bars of colors, RGB and gray. Um, again, writing from this this file instead of previously where we showed you we could actually build the image um, uh, setting the, the the size of the matrix dividing it by four and filling it uh, in in with the colors that you wanted this is reading in a file called uh, video writer test.mpg um, frame per second is set to 30 you can see we're setting the image width to 256 and the height to 1 of 28 similarly we're dividing it by four um, and, um, and essentially, um, you know, it's set to blue, green, red, and gray. 
so the resulting image you can see here was a video stream that's actually playing. Um, you can see the, the taskbar here at the bottom. Now you may also want to convert the color space of, of an image for a particular reason. You may want to convert it from colors to grayscale. It may be that your model um, defined that it's looking for grayscale. Classic example, um, maybe uh, you need to, to convert to like a, an X-ray to more of a grayscale, or it's a, an image that you have an X-ray that maybe did some segmentation on it and colors, and you just need to get rid of that. And you just need to um, convert it to grayscale. So here's some sort of classic use cases. So converting BRG image to RGB or vice versa. Um, you can do that with these functions. So color BRG to RGB or RGB to BRG or BRG or RGB to gray and, and the reverse as well. So some very simple functions um, that do all of that for you rather than you having to build code um, to, to, to do it all um, manually. All right, so now I just ran this bit of code and you can see the two images. Um, so here was the BR, BGR uh, as read from the file and this is the, the BGR converted to RGB. And so we read in this cat.jpg file um, we did a BRG as read from the file um, and we did the image show. Now we're converting BRG to RGB. So we're doing a color conversion on the image uh, and using the function color uh, BRG to RGB. Uh, and on this you know, particular file, because we read it in up here, and then we're doing the show. Now we want to convert uh, RGB to grayscale um, to display it as well. So RGB converted to grayscale um, does not look correct. It says, you know, it, it doesn't. Um, and then show the image, but you can see we use the color RGB to gray. And then uh, a little bit further in this code, grayscale converted to RGB is, is also possible. So essentially the two different forms of um, BRG read in from the file and now the last part of that was RGB converted to grayscale. You know, it doesn't look correct because it's expecting RGB. Uh, and then grayscale converted to RGB looks correct. Yeah, you might want to change the dimensions. Um, now, these next three functions are probably the most common that you'll actually use. Um, and you'll see it demonstrated in the classification uh, uh, Jupyter notebook that we go over. So resize essentially allows you to, you know, if you're wanting to crop, you want to resize an image, you want to, you want to squish it, um, you're able to do that. So with the resize functions, the so cv2.resize with the image array um, and plot it with some extra um, uh, functions that are available. So uh, resampling the the image area um, relation. Um, you can do bicubic interpolation, uh, and and I never say this right, Lanza's interp interpolation, uh, and so forth. If we run this bit of code, so we're reading in this cat file again. We're doing the color conversion BRG to RGB um, and image, and then we're going to resize it. Um, to be 384 by 512 uh, and then display. And you can see all we did was we squished the image. You might actually want to use that more if you get an image that's sort of squished already and you want to unsquish it. <laughs> all right, so now reshaping um, is, is the process where, you know, you might, you might want to reshape your array. So you might want to go from, say, uh, an array of 1 by 24 to 2 by 4 by 3. And this allows you to do that, or vice versa. You might want to go from 2 by 4 by 3 
to a long string of one by 24. And it's all depending on how you want to maybe store it in, in storage. So what's going on in this code? So first we created a one by 24, so a 1D array um, and the size of you know 24. Uh, then we are reshaping this array to two by four by three. Uh, you can see filling in with two, four, uh, the size, sorry, is two, four, three. Uh, and then reshape two by four by three back to 124. And so what we get plotted out on all this printfs is the first time we get plotted out is a one by 24 array, so zero to 23. Then after the reshape to two by four by three, we can see it's reshaped to two by four, or sorry, three by four. Uh, and then, uh, the reshape back to uh, to uh, uh, one by twenty four from zero to twenty three. Okay, so then you can also use the transpose function if you want to reorder the dimension axes. Um, so in this um, case you can see how height and width have been reversed. So essentially it's turning at 90 degrees. Uh, and this bit of code, so you might want to change like height, uh, width, channel, um, so row, column, channel, um, to channel, row, column. And you can do that using that transpose function. Okay, so what we did in this was we imported our libraries, again, important. We created the array. Um, we reshaped the array. Now we're going to transpose the array from height width channels, channels width height. Then we're um, reading in an image, again, cat, uh, the cat image. We're also doing a little bit of color conversion, uh, BGR to RGB. Uh, and then we're transposing. Um, as well, this image. So it's two examples. So the first one shows how the, um, in this section, how the array started out and then the transpose to three by, uh, by two by four uh, and how it looks in the array now uh, versus in this format. A little less easier to read um, in that. And so we have our cat image, so something more realistic than looking at, you know, an array of, of numbers. And we transposed it by just turning it uh, essentially 90 degrees. Then you might want to split and merge um, as well. So splitting out your channels uh, may be needed because maybe you want to um, specifically apply a change to a specific channel or specific color. You maybe want to, you know, zero out um, the green, or you may want to tint it, or something like that. So in this example, again, we're um, setting up the array and printing out uh, those, and so you can see how uh, it's been sort of reshaped in this way. So we split out the channels. So channel zero, one, and two are um, reported out rather than a 3D array. And then you might also want to merge. So that's sort of the reverse function. So here's what we have with these three channels separated out and their values in the channels. And after merging, um, this is what the array ends up looking like. And in the code, you know, we have, okay, a channel zero set with these values, channel one and two set with these values, um, printing those, so printing channel zero, printing channel one, and then two, then merging using the cv2.merge, merging all three channels and then printing out the merged array. And that's what the result is here, an merged array. Now, concatenating images, 
you might want to combine two images. Um, so you can see in the image here, we've taken two images that have certain heights and we've added them uh, together, uh, one on top of the other with this V concat. And now it processed. And I'll just show you the process results before going out back up to the code. So we've now got an image of a cat and a dog. And so we've merged them to be a cat and a dog uh, together. Okay, we set up our libraries. Um, we read in images into a three-dimensional array. So cat um, here and dog here. Then we resized um, and in this use case, and then we uh, read in the file. We concatenated the image with cb2.vcat, so image one and image two. And then we plotted it and and printed it. So I am show my, my printing it. And a horizontal concatenation runs very similarly, but it's H concat rather than V concat. Okay, so you got dog, cat, now side by side. And very similarly, import your libraries, read in your files, read in your file. Uh, this is doing a color conversion uh, and then resize uh, these two. And then uh, see, we're doing the horizontal concat here of image one and image two after you have read them in uh, and done your any conversions that you want, like uh, the color conversion and the resizing. Right, so that's a very, very basic Jupyter Notebook, and it's not really about AI, but it's about the steps to be able to be prepared for the AI. So it'll get more interesting from here. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop, take a sip of water, and see if there's any questions. No questions now, um, but we'll see if anyone pops something in the chat, and I'll let you know. Now gets to the really much more interesting parts, like I guarantee you. So we get to really into AI now. So, you know, computer vision and AI changing industries, and I said, like, you can see this in, in lots of different use cases. Um, now is a great time to be studying AI. You're, you, if you're studying AI in really in whatever uh, method, if you're in business or if you're in computer science, this will be a valuable to you to, to understand and know. So you can talk the language at least, but then also be able to um, to, to do some of these um, developments. Um, but industries are really uh, needing this kind of technology. So for example, um, AI is used in emergency response, you know, so you could have computer vision, um, and, you know, kind of detect for fires. Um, in education, we're using computer vision in in classrooms to to uh, you know detect, um, frankly, um, you know if, if students engaging um, when they raise their hand, those sorts of things. If it's a, a virtual classroom, um, trying to be able to detect those things um, in smart cities. Um, I'm going to go over use cases. There's so many different use cases. Smart home, this is the classic example that I like to make this sort of very real to you. So if you had a smart home doorbell and that doorbell has a camera on it and, and obviously you know, it's, it's looking for images. Typically they also have a microphone, um, they're listening for sounds. And of course there's a method there for, um, for when it detects something that goes by, a person comes by, a person, um, it, you know, it notices something, uh, then it can send an alert depending on how the, the homeowner has set the parameters saying, you know, we noticed somebody come to your door, drop off a package or something like that. Um, and they can also be listening. I have um, 
personally, I have Nest cameras at home, and they sometimes detect they detect talking, uh, and they even detect dog barking. Um, so you know, different use cases, both in AI in sort of language or sound processing, and AI in vision. So in terms of cities, um, you know, cities are really facing new market pressures. We've got increased urbanization. We've got increased vehicle emissions, um, more and more connected vehicles on the road. Uh, we have autonomous driving uh, really becoming um, a reality. Um, Teslas and other vehicles uh, deploying autonomous uh, driving. Even Intel has its own uh, mobile eye company uh, deploying autonomous uh, technology um, for manufacturers. Um, traffic growth obviously is, is you know, increasing the odds of, of dangerous use conditions. How do we navigate around that? We need to use technology and we'll need to use AI and road construction, of course. And we also are crowdsourcing this information to be able to make us aware as, as consumer users of these roads of like where to navigate, how to navigate around, you know, using um, ways and other mapping technologies and so forth. So really driving AI uh, at the edge is critically important. So you've got use cases in utilities and public um, services, such as education, healthcare, and public safety, environmental monitoring as well, um, you know, uh, transportation infrastructure, safety, um, listening to, um, you know, there are devices out there that, that are, are monitoring our cities for um, events that could be happening, like fires or like gunshots or, you know, all sorts of things. Listening, uh, even detecting um, for um, air quality, all those things are done with really with AI. Buildings, we have to make our buildings um, smarter and more efficient. So we're using less um, uh, fossil fuels. Um, and then transportation, of course, to make sure that our connected transportation runs more efficiently, more smoothly, where consumers need it to be. So it's leading to this huge market opportunity, 135 billion um, market opportunity um, by 2021, which was last year actually. So I'm sure it's even increased um, now. And then 328 billion global IoT transportation market is huge. 15 times uh, more shipments in edge AI devices by 2023. So really the edge is where uh, things are being driven. Where, you know, we've been very much, in, I'd say in the last 10, 15 years in a cloud centric environment with you know, mobile phones and devices and applications that connect and deliver data to us from a cloud. And that will continue. But the edge is where this huge explosion is gonna occur in, in conjunction with the cloud and, and connecting those types of the edge and the cloud um, use cases together. So there's many approaches to AI and analytics. There's lots of different um, types of AI. So there's like supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So supervised learning, um, a little bit more structured and unsupervised learning, which is making sense of a lot of data that's that's uh, and how to correlate it. Um, Semi-supervised and then reinforced learning and then transfer learning as well. So taking, um, taking uh, maybe one AI model and applying it to another. Now, in AI, there's sort of machine learning, and then there's deep learning. And there's a di difference. So machine learning is more the realm of, of classic uh, math um, applications, math uh, libraries um, deployed to make sense of the data. And then deep learning is really about uh, both the math applications, but the structure of deep learning is about um, creating uh, mechanisms that essentially learn um, how the brain functions, and I'll show you that on the next slide. But we do this for, and we use deep learning for image processing, which is largely what this course is about, but also speech processing, natural language processing, um, recommender systems, and adversarial networks. So um, OpenVINO is a toolkit for inference. Inference is really about the deployment of AI that's been developed and, and trained to do something. And we'll get to this in a bit, but it's a difference between AI training and AI inference. So AI training is the aspect of creating your model and training it on a large data set to, 
to be able to do what you want it to do. Maybe it is a model that detects just for cats, for example. So you've trained it on 100,000 images of cats and you've defined uh, to, to learn for cats and identify when a cat maybe comes into frame and maybe what type of cat it is to be able to classify it. Um, OpenVINO can also do image, but it can also do speech and natural language processing. So you can run like BERT um, type uh, AI models, which are commonly used for um, NLP, um, to be able to deploy OpenVINO in devices that uh, you want to have react to your own voice. Um, in the other areas, the so recommender and adversarial network. So um, those things are, are right now probably typically more um, um, positioned in the cloud. Uh, they need to be streamlined down for the edge, but they're about um, not images or language, but about um, uh, taking in data and uh, determining uh, decisions, if you will. So the difference between sort of machine learning and deep learning. So in the classic machine learning, which um, classic computer vision machine learning has been around for quite a long time, but it was, it's more using, if you have, have an image, like an image of a face, you might use just classic um, characteristics of an image, like the roundness of the face, the distance between the nose, the eyes, the eye sockets and so forth. And you, you will use sort of classic mathematical algorithms to get to the result of saying, okay, this is Arjun, who's a colleague here. Um, in deep learning, you, deep learning neural networks have been developed to, to function with multiple nodes and maybe fully connected, maybe um, in certain um, flows connected, sometimes in reverse and back through. And they're designed essentially how a brain functions and, and our synapses and our, our, our neural functions like a brain, that's why they're called neural networks. So you have lots of different layers um, processing these functions to get to the same result. So in, in a convolutional neural network, the classic um, layout of this, and there's a great article, you could check it out on towardsdatascience.com by Sumita Saha, but this really articulates how um, computer architecture processes and breaks down an image. Again, an image is like three channels. You can see how this image has three channels. This is an image of a car. And we're really trying to reduce this down and process these these uh, parts one by one. And sometimes if we have a, a, a large amount of compute uh, simultaneously, but then piece them all back together. Remember, computers function essentially very linearly. And, and in, in terms of data, data is, is typically structured very linearly. So we're trying to squeeze this down and then process it. So you might take an image and you, you'll process it one by one and keep going down. So you do these different layers, the convolution and the Rayleigh layer, and you'll pool it together. You might do it over and over again, squeeze it down and get it down to a layer where you can then go, okay, I trained this model on a number of objects and it can detect cars, trucks, vans, bicycles, and so forth. So why deep learning? So both image and speech recognition, the power of compute and the power of these neural networks have become so powerful and so accurate that you can see they're more accurate and more powerful than the human. So our human brain stayed pretty much constant at the level of, of, of detection before we start to have errors. With image recognition and speech recognition, we're able to do, do that much more easily with with computers now and this has really led to a 13 trillion dollar additional economic impact by 2030 as uh as um, reported and 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 estimated uh, down in the the footnote as you can see but there's a lot of considerations to take into effect so there's the workload you know what is your workload profile there's requirements um so what do you need in terms of uh, of data throughput, how efficient does it need to be, how accurate does it need to be, um, what's the size of your data, you know, how much performance can you um, process, and so then what's your demand going to be? And in terms of sort of the requirements of the demand, they, they go hand in hand, that if you, if you consider um, edge devices, and I use the example of a smart um, home doorbell. It's a very small device and you can only fit so much um, performance into that device because they're typically battery powered, right? And you have to take the battery out 
every few months and recharge it and, and pop it back in. Um, and in in case maybe it would be um, direct powered, but there are devices out there that need to be deployed by battery or even by solar, and you can only um, perform under a certain uh, footprint there. So you have to consider what your requirements are and then your demands of your compute. And here at Intel, we believe that that not just one type of compute is going to service the needs of AI. You may need to use different ones, and you may need to combine them all. So that's why we offer CPUs, GPUs, ASICs, such as VPUs, the vision processing units, so discrete sort of ASICs that are defined for, for specifically for neural functioning, and then FPGAs, which are field programmable gate arrays, which are more flexible for um, uh, industrial developers who want to reprogram in the field, they might deploy it, but then have to um, redeploy it, uh, retrain it, um, and re, you know, configure it in the field. The OpenVO toolkit is allowing developers to do this, and we've open sourced our developer kit. So this is not a proprietary developer kit. Uh, it, is, it is completely open source. So Number one, we'd say we always tell um, developers and customers, you know, maximize the use of your CPU as much as possible. Um, we like to joke that it's actually sort of the the, um, the most um, ubiquitous resource on the planet, maybe behind you know water and air, because almost every device has a CPU. Even devices that deploy a GPU often have a CPU next to them. So then you can optimize and you can have a device and you can choose, okay, I want to use different architectures together. And with OpenVINO, you can. So you can combine the power of CPU, GPU, and VPU, even in one device. And with OpenVINO, you can write with the same API and you can deploy to these multiple architectures. And in fact, in your application, you know, you can do an application with one model, but you could do an application with multiple models. And each model may have multiple layers. And you can split out those models to different architectures, and you can even split out the layers to different architectures. And you will you will also be able to uh, deploy and have the architecture with OpenVINO say, okay, what architectures are available in this system? I'm going to load balance for you. You can do it manually, or you can have it done for you. So there's challenges in deep learning, of course, you know, and each inference need is is unique, and there's so many models out there. I'm going to show you the our Open Model Zoo, which has over 200 available models to start from. Uh, but developers are constantly coming out and training new models. They're re refining models, improving them, because they're they're you know the, these data scientists are coming out with new ways to architect and the math uh, of architecting these models. So there is. You know, with this change requires being able to address this. Um, there's integration changes, right, of how to really streamline your way to end-to-end -end workflow. AI is not necessarily easy. That also means, though, that it's job um, security in some ways, you know, and that's why AI jobs um, are high paying. So, again, we say no one size fits all. Um, you'll need a, you know, a diverse set of architectures to really deploy um, use cases. And also, when you design a, a system, that system may need to be deployed for 15 years. Um, we make our, our chips, many of our chips, available for up to 15 years. So you have to account for um, future growth. So with OpenVINO, you have this high performance deep learning inference that's available, and you can do the streamlined and ease of use of deployment, and it's right once deploy anywhere. So the API works on all of these architectures. Um, OpenVINO, it's being deployed across industries, so industrial, so like machine vision, um, human to machine interfaces, um, healthcare and life sciences, again, pneumonia detection example and the brain tumor segmentation example, so being deployed for diagnostic reasons. In retail, um, you know, we retail's uh, customers are looking for ways to improve and secure. Um, their environments, but also improve on how they sell to customers and improve the experience for customers. The customers want to get in and out fast. Uh, they may also want to be able to have a, like a frictionless checkout uh, to be able to scan and check on the on their own. And then safety as well is is a use case where you know cameras are deployed, such as in airports, um, in rail systems, and so forth. Um, 
to keep us all safe. So with Open Dino, we have sort of like um, three phases. You, first you build, then you optimize, and then you deploy. And so let's dive down a bit into the Open Vino toolkit to explain under the covers what this toolkit uh, is composed of. Uh, I'd like to pause and see, are there any questions? None that I see. Okay. So Open Vino is comprised of, of two main components and then additional tools as part of it. Now, how Open Vino works is, number one, there's what's called a model optimizer. The model optimizer takes in a model from that you bring in as a trained model, or you could use one of our, um, to start with, one of our models from our open model zoo. The model optimizer does some initial um, optimizations of where it can recognize how it can shrink the model down a bit and make it run faster. Um, then it converts it to what we call an intermediate representation format, a dot bin and a dot XML. And the reason why that's needed is we is it's essentially um, converting it to a common form factor so that these architectures you see here on the left, I'm sorry, on the right, all can understand. It's a common file format that these architectures understand so that one API can be used across all these different architectures. So the the left purple box is the model optimizer. The right purple box is the API suite that you deploy inside an application for the for the inference so that your application is running over and over again. That's what inference is, is essentially it's deployed and running over and over again, constantly trying to detect what it's trained to do. Now I said we have all these different architectures like CPU, integrated GPUs, as well as discrete GPUs. We have our VP, excuse me, our VPU, uh, Intel Movidius, and then GNA is um, Gaussian neural network architecture. That's for speech. Those are typically also um, embedded into a CPU uh, from Intel. Um, though there are um, there are manufacturers that produce uh, uh, chipset components off to the side. Uh, one question that you might ask is: in, Can OpenVINO be used with other architectures? Um, Intel's directly supports our own architectures, but it's open source. There is a community version for ARM. Um, we lead, uh, leave it to the community to support um, other architectures. So under the hood, a little bit of an explanation um, further. So you bring in a model, the training part happens somewhere else. I wanna emphasize that OpenVINO is not for training, though there is a GitHub Jupyter Notebook tutorial, which I'll I'll touch on at the end uh, for, for training extensions. But model training um, typically happens you know, outside. You, you, you build a model using a, a framework library like TensorFlow, uh, CAFE, Kaldi, um, MXNet, and Onyx. Um, or you can use something from our open model zoo. And we actually have over 200 models in there now. So you use those. You do the model optimization to convert it to the IR format. There's other tools available in the toolkit for um, additional optimizations. Post-training and optimization tool allows you say you have a model that started out with as a floating point 32 size, and you may want to run it on GPU. So it needs to be done, maybe uh, converted to floating point 16. Um, or you may want to convert it all the way down to int 8 um, to be able to run it on, 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 on the, you know, an ASIC, a much smaller um, uh, chipset that requires uh, a model size to be smaller to be able to, to really function properly. Um, deep learning workbench is a GUI based tool uh, where you can see your model, you can do the conversion there. Um, actually, the post training optimization tool is part of that GUI um, uh, workbench. You can see how it, it performs in accuracy, how much drop in accuracy um, in the down training. Um, we have deep learning streamer, which is really about building a, a, a full stream of images and video as well as audio. Um, so streaming that together and doing uh, inference on the stream. Um, and then built in is OpenCV. That was our first Jupyter Notebook to really be able to do those basic functions uh, and code samples uh, and demos. And then of course the API engine is what um, helps us this common IR format um, and then using the API engine to be able to uh, plug in 
and run on all these different architectures. And our deployment manager is a tool that you, you, you finish your, your development and you can package it up in a way and, and deploy it down to the edge. So supported frameworks, there's a lot of supported frameworks and they, they crop up new ones from time to time. The ones that we natively support are the, the large ones. So TensorFlow, Cafe, MXNet, um, Caldi, um, and then Onyx. And Onyx is a unique one in that uh, Onyx was established by uh, Microsoft, um, a really good partner of ours. Uh, and they use uh, what's called the Open Neural Network Exchange. So they have a format as well, the, the Onyx format. And they support all of these different um, smaller logo um, uh, frameworks. So if you want to use some of those frameworks, you can convert it to the Onyx format, and then you can convert it to the OpenVINO format as well. So in model optimization, I mentioned that, you know, it's largely for this conversion to the IR format, but it does a few other uh, optimization techniques. So linear op op operation fusing, it, it looks at the model and sees, okay, where can I linearize this? Um, some additional optimization for stride and group convolution for using, so fusing um, convolutions uh, to make it run faster. This is important to remember. So different architectures require different model sizes. Um, so the, the idea of sort of down training it to a smaller format is called quantization. And the reason why the industry is is seeking this um, benefit of, of quantizing is that, you know, they're wanting to reduce uh, the size of models without reducing the accuracy much, if at all. Um, and our workbench helps sort of compare models and see um, how it might have um, uh, performed both at maybe the full size model and down downtrend. But you can see here with these different architectures with CPU, you can use any of them, any sizes. Um, with GPU, you can also do, but it's preferred really to use FP16. You can see FP32 is preferred with CPU. You just have a lot more compute power in, in a general compute CPU. Um, VPU plugins are, are ASIC for Movidius. Um, only FP16 is supported and GNA um, supports FP32 and FP16. So the, we're now getting into the inference engine overview and sort of a API um, overview before we go into our, our next uh, Jupyter Notebook. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, the API suite with OpenVINO is, is what you build into a bigger application. And that's what the sort of the, the circles represent. So you may have a, an application that uh, is going to, you know, process and store and forward data. It's going to react to requests. Uh, it's going to trigger actions. In the case of that, you know, that doorbell, a, a, a standard doorbell with no smarts in it, um, you know, the, the person pushing the button is really triggering the action, but the device itself is ringing the doorbell. Um, with a smart door, door, doorbell, essentially you, you build in an API inference. It is typically monitoring before somebody even presses the doorbell, it's capturing an image. It may, depending on how the homeowner has set, uh, may send an alert to the homeowner. Um, but the inference part is really what's looking for those inf insights, both in audio, it may be look listening for sounds, and in video, and looking for as people walk by, if somebody leaves a package and so forth. So you can run AI networks and you know the images from, for things like you know identifying pedestrians, um, listening for voice, classifying objects um, and, and tracking object movement. The API inference um, workflow is essentially what this format is. So with OpenVINO, uh, and we'll see this in the Jupyter Notebook. So first you create an inference engine core object with IE core and you read the intermediate representation. And so you set the network with the read network function and you can see where it says, you know, you're reading in model XML and the model bin. So this is after the, the model optimization step. So you now have this, these formats of the .bin and .xml file. And so you read it into the network. You want to prepare your inputs and your outputs into blobs. 
Um, and then you want to load your network. So you're going to load the network that you read in uh, into the exec net um, function and then set what your device name is. So you're really setting it to the device you want it to go to, um, like the CPU or the GPU, for example. Um, you're going to prepare your input frames. So this is where you're essentially preparing. You, first, you've, you know, you've set up and, and initialized your, your model to be run. Now you're, you're preparing your input frames or your input video. This is where you're putting in that video stream or those images, uh, how they need to be. So we went over this in the OpenCP Open um, Jupyter Notebook, where you might have to prepare your input frames um, over and over again, by frame by frame, um, your, you know, your, your channels, um, putting it into the blob, your height, weight, height and width. Um, and then you might have to resize it, transpose it, and reshape it to how the model is expecting. So your model may be designed for that specific format. And that's why it was so important for me to go over that OpenCV uh, tutorial. Finally, you get to the run inference set. So with execnet and the infer, and you're inferring it on the blob in the frames that was set over here. And you're processing the results. And of course, this is a loop. And this will just keep running until you have some action to stop it. Of course, you're processing the results, and in that smart doorbell camera um, uh, example, is it's just running, running, running. Somebody walks by, and it may capture an image, and it may store that to the cloud. And those are the triggers, and those are the things that that um, may be processed, and then, however, uh, that product is designed, may store those images and say, you know, these three people walked by my house today. We have the additional tools I mentioned. So the model downloader uh, is a tool. We have this uh, open model zoo with over 200 models, Intel pre-trained models, as well as industry ones that are open source and we put there. Uh, and we have a tool in, in OpenVINO that you can read them out and you can download any of them that you want. We don't include them in OpenVINO by default because it would bloat the size of the, the install, but you can grab them down from a, a cloud location essentially. Um, the benchmark app, you know, helps, helps you to measure the performance, so the throughput and the latency of your model, uh, and get performance metrics. Uh, the deployment manager, so you want to generate um, a deployment package, uh, and you may want to deploy in a smaller footprint of a deployment package, so you can customize your deployment package. And then accuracy checker as well is is to help you check the the accuracy of your model um, using the original of your model and then the converted after it's been converted to the intermediate representation. And then additional um, tools that are available. These are typically available on GitHub um, as marketed as part of OpenVINO. Um, the CVAT tool, the computer vision annotation tool is, you know, you, you might have a whole host of images that you need to annotate of what's in them. Um, before you do training. So it's a tool to help you sort of collect your images and, and, and put uh, uh, metadata on your images um, of what it is. Um, Deep Learning Streamer is about building that complex um, uh, AI um, uh, stream with both video and audio. Uh, and then some of these other ones, like Neural Network Compression Framework, um, so frameworks based on, on PyTorch for you know being quantized aware, and then training extensions. I mentioned um, some tutorials on how to do some training extensions. You can train models. So you're not training models with OpenVINO, but you can train models with CPUs. That's possible. It just takes a lot longer. That's why people prefer to use a cloud service like, like um, Microsoft Azure or AWS, where they have the compute power and lots of GPUs available, so you can just do it quickly. Okay, so Open Model Zoo. Um, I mentioned we have like over 200 uh, available models in here. These are pre-trained, and I am going to go to this uh, now. I'll give you a little walkthrough of this. So if you just Google Intel Open Model Zoo, these are all on GitHub, free to use. 
posted now in GitHub. Um, there's a bit of, you know, the narrative, what's in here. Um, there are models for um, the Intel and public pre-trained models, and they're organized a bit. So let's go into the Intel pre-trained models, and you'll see uh, models for object detection, the face, person, vehicle, pedestrian, those sorts of things, product detection, um, object recognition, so for classifying um, types of models, um, things that you can do, again, um, you, for example, this one here, there's a model that's been trained um, where you could use it on your own camera and it can, uh, it, it is predicting what your mood is and it, it moves kind of fast because you can, you know, you can move your lips and you can say, oh, like this person's sad, this person's happy and so forth. Um, there's a, several pose estimation ones where you can sort of uh, have it, a, a camera trained on people and it can detect their movements. And that's actually kind of particularly um, used in use cases um, like sports, sports medicine, you know, identifying the movements of, um, of athletes um, and then to replay that and help them optimize say their, their, their golf swing or, or, or other sorts of things. Um, other use cases in here, other models. So like uh, re-identification models um, as well. So tracking objects uh, and then semantic segmentation. This is used, this kind of um, model is used in uh, autonomous vehicles and robots commonly because what it does is it paints uh, over an image and different um, color spaces of like the roads this color, the signs are this color, um, so that the automation can easily identify um, and, and navigate in the environment that it's in. So that's in our pre-trained models, um, public pre-trained models. Um, these are, are organized like classification uh, and so forth, uh, but you see they're typically named by um, you know, the data scientists who develop them and they might want to name them efficient net or HBO net um, and so forth. Sometimes they're funny names. Uh, sometimes if they have a like a 128 or 224, this means how many layers are in that model. And so there's lots of public models as well that do uh, classification, object detection, uh, segmentation and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to go to back to DevCloud. So I want you to follow along again. Um, getting back to DevCloud. Um, before I move on, anybody need help in, in re-navigating back to DevCloud? No feedback at the moment. I'll update you if there is. Okay, open the object detection um, tutorial here. It's back in that tutorial section on learn on the learn tab. So now we're really going to get into AI and we're going to go through this object detection sample. So a number of prerequisites. So we have our Jupyter notebook, obviously, uh, and then we have a labels text file. So this model is um, trained to detect over a thousand different objects. And there's a label text file for that to, to, to correspond to um, your video stream. And here we're supplying a video stream of cars um, on a highway. Uh, and the labels text actually does a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, we're gonna see like dogs, cats, and birds uh, in this example, I think in this, Example. Oh, you know, I, I apologize. I'm out of order. I want to go through classification first. I do apologize. So go back to your learn tab and open classification. Okay. Yes, this is the order I want going. This is the one that has dogs, cats, and birds. Um, uh, so we'll have our Jupyter Notebook. 
and it's trained on this model, this SqueezeNet 1.1 XML model. And in, in the open model zoo, the SqueezeNet model is in here. So let's just take a peek at what this model says. So it says that it is, um, it was actually improved over the 1.1 model, right? Um, the input blob, it, you know, it is expecting BGR in this order. Um, and it tells you the size, it's a classification, how many G flops it takes and parameters and the accuracy. And, you know, the, the original model uh, was this, but the converted model is this, is, is what it's expecting. Um, and you can download the model with our command um, with the open model zoo downloader um, tool. So now back to the labels file. So we have all our files here. Okay. And then this file is our labels file. And you can see that it's uh, it is, it's needed for this model to work. The developer who wrote this um, developed it, and as you can see, that's over like birds and dogs and cats and vehicles and all sorts of things that it's trained. And they train this model on probably hundreds of thousands of images to make sure that the accuracy got to be really good. Um, but you can see this is the model, and it'll essentially when we see the model functioning on the images that we supply, so the bird, the cat, the dog, um, you'll see what it um, outputs. So there's a bit of introduction here that I won't go through, but it's about OpenVINO. Um, many of these uh, tutorials have this. So again, you train a model somewhere else or bring in a trained model, and we're bringing in this SqueezeNet 1.1, uh, running it through the model optimizer to create the IR format, and then running the inference on it. Again, a little bit of tutorial on the, the API that workflow that I went in. So loading the plugin, reading the network model, um, loading the model, preparing the inputs, running the inference, and then processing the output. Also, um, input, you'll need to resize, transpose, and reshape. And batch size is really just specifying, you know, how many images at once uh, you're uh, uh, processing inference on. Okay, so we have our standard imports um, of libraries that we need. So like the OS specified, um, CV2 for OpenCV, a time to be able to do time tracking, NumPy for the dimensional array for the manipulation of the images, uh, the OpenVINO inference engine itself, uh, and then the matplotlib um, for the displaying output results. So first set of code is really just importing the, um, the standard libraries. I'll import it successfully. And so you would write that into your application. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna download the raw model um, using the downloader.py, um, it's a, a Python command, downloading by name, the SqueezeNet 1.1. So you can see it's downloading. It is a cafe model. And then after this finishes downloading, we're going to convert it. And the convert model is also another Python command, the converter.py, uh, again, on the name of this and the raw model. Okay, so you can see it's converting this model to IR, one at FP16. Um, you can see where it pulled uh, the model from. A lot of this you can somewhat take, take for granted, but it, it could be important to know if you want to um, reapply. It's using the model optimizer. Um, this command sort of helps simplify some of this um, code for you.
and it's telling you the attributes of this uh, model. And then we also converted uh, one to FP32. So we have both versions of the model available to us. All right, now there's some sort of standard arguments that we're gonna configure. So we're gonna configure model XML and model bin to pull in the, the, the files, the dot, dot .xml and the dot .bin files. We're gonna set up the input path and the device specifying the targets, so like a CPU, GPU, FPGA, or Myriad, which is the VPU. Um, we can report on the number of um, classification results in the report. And then the labels path is that labels file that I showed you over here, so importing that in. Okay, so in this code, what we've done is we've imported the two files. Now we're importing the path, so the image of the dog. Um, we're doing a, a CPU extension library uh, as well. Uh, and then we're doing the CPU, we're setting the device as CPU. And then display the top results. We're just gonna display the top 10 results. Um, we're importing the labels file into labels path. And then we're printing out the results. So we imported all those things in and set those. Now we're gonna create the inference engine and this goes back to that workflow. And the first thing you do is instantiate the inference engine core. Just with IE equals IE core. So inference engine object has been created. Now we're going to create the network. I hope you're all following along. You can run this on your own. So we are, you're reading in the network, which means reading in the, the XML and the bin file. And then we're just printing out um, what they are. Um, then we're also querying the number of, or the, the layers that are supported in here into supported layers. We're going to check to make sure that the model's inputs and outputs are what are expected. And if not, then we'll, you know, kick out of it and report an error. Um, but we have reported we're successfully, um, we've successfully imported those files. Sometimes, you know, maybe a model is so new that there's a layer type that's not supported by OpenVINO. Uh, and Intel works with developers on, they've come up with something new uh, and we, you know, we work on developing that support. Because um, like I said, AI is, is rapidly changing. Now we're gonna load the model uh, and, and into the, the plugins um, with the exec net and essentially um, setting up the input and output blobs. So we've loaded the model uh, and the network name to the device that we set the CPU um, storing the name of the input and outputs in the blobs. And then we're reading the input dimensions. So like the, the batch size, the number of channels, the height and the width. So the NCHW. So loaded model, device to CPU, the model input dimensions that are expecting a batch size of one, three channels and height and width uh, the same. And I think that goes back to what we were expecting with this model of what it was expecting here. Okay, now for loading the labels. And the labels again is what is, the, is essentially um, tells the model how to interpret what it's seeing and tell you what the results are. So we loaded uh, the labels file, um, so it was loaded successfully. Now we'll prepare our inputs. Okay, so we're doing we're doing a video capture, much like we did. We're using OpenCV. Um, we're getting the uh, storing the input width and the height. 
uh, we're loading the input image, with the, the read. Now we're going to resize, transpose, and resave, or setting define these functions. Loading the image, um, resizing, and then displaying the image. And in this case, it's the dog, uh, dog image, from Chihuahua. Now that we have, you know, the input and the the, the image set up, we're going to actually do the inference. Okay, so in this case, we're not going to reprint out the image because you already know what it is. But we we started the time, we did the exact net and in inferring on the input blob by frames, and in this case, it's one. Uh, and then we're going to um, capture what the time was. Uh, to run this inference, and the result says inference complete, and the runtime took 19.72 milliseconds to do the inference. Now we'll process and display the results. And I'll go back up to the code and explain what's going on with that. You can see the results already. So it is saying that for the top 10 results on this image, it's saying that it is most likely a Chihuahua, with the other ones being a lesser percentage. And this was the image again that we were processing the results on. Right, so we set up our 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 matrix, uh, our input. Um, then we did, uh, you know, report the top n and print the top ten um, results from the values that we had set. Um, we're going to remove the dimensions of length one. We're going to sort the results uh, essentially to, you know, the top results. Um, we're going to um, show the results and we're going to print out probability of what it is over and over again uh, from the top results on down and display the results as well. Now, in this tutorial, you can also run three additional exercises. So you can run a different image. And I think in this image, are we getting to the cat? Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to do one on a cat. So running the inference on now the cat, because you'd already set up the, the network and prepared it. Now you're just taking another image and putting it into that essentially a stream. Uh, and it's saying that it is a almost 60 percent that it's a tabby cat. So if we look at the image of the cat that we use, it's again that image that we used in the OpenCV tutorial, and you can see it's an image of a cat. You could also run your own image. Um, you could set your own input path if you can pull the image in a, JP, uh, a JPEG format from a, a web location. Um, you can always though upload it to your own files over here. Um, let's see what it did. And then hey, this you have a question. Yep. It says, would not giving the model the image format it expects cause the model to crash or just give wrong results? It could be either, but probably more than likely it would it would just give the wrong results. Thank you. Yeah, and so this one, um, we pulled in an image of a daisy. So um, our results and it classified it says it's 99% a daisy. And you can also do in this um, tutorial, run a, a, a batch, so a number of images at once. So dog, cat, and bird. Um, and so if we ran that, loaded those images, dog, cat, and bird. And then we'll run the inference. The network's batch size is set of three instead of one. Um, and the input uh, inference complete, it took 39 milliseconds to complete the inference on the batch of three. Again, all of these images needed to be set to the the expectation of the size. Um, I think it was 20, 227 by 227 uh, to be able to run and then the, in the channel format. And then you can run your own batch set, you know, of images and I won't I won't run this um, 
that you can run that on your own um, to explore. So that gives you an idea of classification. So we built up this concept of, of how to use OpenCV, how it's used with AI, the models, the model expectations, where to find models, um, how to build up the inference uh, engine API um, through code. Um, and yeah, so that's a, um, that particular tutorial. Now let's go on to the object detection tutorial, which is the one I uh, mistakenly started uh, initially. So object detection, we're going to build on that particular tutorial bit, but show you more about how the power of the dev cloud and you can use the hardware that's there and benchmark results. So again, in this, there is a labels file. Um, this is using a, uh, a video stream, um, an MP4 of cars on a highway. Uh, and we're going to do things like detect um, vehicles. I think that also detects motorcycles and draw bounding boxes, um, which uh, you need the OpenCV library to, to be able to do. Um, so when you see them come across the stream. Okay, so some key concepts here. Uh, video and image input, you know, we're using OpenCV to do that. We're going to draw the bounding boxes I, I explained. Um, we're going to view the results. Um, we're going to use asynchronous um, function in inference engine. And what that means is, is that OpenVINO can be run in synchronous or asynchronous mode. And as you're processing a model, a model is made, made up of multiple layers, and you may be able to start another layer before you finish the previous one. So you can try to um, compress the time and the amount that it, uh, of time it takes to, to run the API, and then finally um, process the results. We're also going to see and run this over multiple sets of, of, of hardware that are in the cloud. Okay, so let's get down to So this is a bit about how it works again. Um, uh, you know, the, the frames were pre-processed uh, and supplied. Uh, and we're going to do bounding boxes. So we'll need to identify like the frame ID number and then um, the coordinates to be able to do the bounding boxes. Um, it'll result out the labels of the, you know, identifying what's in the, in the frame, uh, vehicle, motorcycle. Uh, detection time uh, also it takes. Then it'll do you know a bit of post processing and, and you'll see the results when we get down to this video section. All right, so we're going to set some in this uh, tutorial. Uh, we're going to set essentially uh, some out, uh, some parameters, and then there are some parameters that need things on the command line. So the input path. Um, the where the XML file comes from, the input video, so dash I, um, the labels. Um, uh, there's a parameter in the commands for uh, the output file uh, where it be stored, the device to be used with the dash D, so CPU, GPU, or Myriad, so VPU, uh, and the maximum number of requests. You can see in this labels file, it's um, essentially defined to identify, uh, you know, this sets of things. So uh, vehicles, but also animals. Okay. Again, standard imports um, of libraries, so OS, time, um, the matplotlib, um, system parameters. Um, so we can get parameters from the systems that they're running on. So we'll run this. Imported all these model, uh, uh, sorry, all of these Python modules successfully. Now we're going to show you, again, the downloader function where we downloaded the SqueezeNet 1.1 model in the classification tutorial. You can download, uh, and actually before downloading, you can just print them all. So you can see all the available uh, models that are available in the open model zoo that I showed you over there on GitHub. And that's where it's, it's uh, pulling from. So you can see all the models that are available um, uh, to use. This particular um, 
tutorial is using a mobile net SSD uh, model uh, that's in the open model zoo. So here we're going to download the model. So it's, it's using the downloader.py. It's going to make a directory. Uh, it's going to uh, you know, essentially you know, download, find the model. So the models were downloaded, the raw models. It's a cafe model as well. It's mobile net SSD. And if you wanted to view the model graph, so you could you could view the model graph and if this will make a little more sense once I show it. So remember I, I said um, uh, models are multiple layers and these uh, nodes that are are interconnected. Why didn't it open? Try to run it again. Oh, I apologize for that. Um, we'll try it again a little bit later if we have time and see if we can um, pull from it. I don't want to close my my uh, tutorial out, but what it'll show is like a, a tree structure of all of the, um, the layers um, to show you how the, the layers of that model are interconnected. Okay, now in this section, we're going to create the IR files. So this is the model optimization, the model conversion. So we're going to create an FP16 IR files and also an FP32 um, um, with these values from this particular model that we downloaded. And so you can see, let's see where it is. So it's putting it into a directory for um, FP16 and one for FP32. We had success. Now, if we wanted to create an int8 precision version of IR, we could use the post-trading optimization tool as well. Is there a question? Uh, not that I know of. Sure, Vansu, you, might you have a question? Let's see you're taking yourself off mute. So this is the help function, most help function are dash help. So if you wanted to um, print out with the, um, the helper result. There you go. So there's the, so all the help text essentially and what the configurations are um, and the flags uh, to be able to use the post training optimization tool. So now we're going to change the, uh, we're going to convert um, the model using the YAML file, which is supplied um, with your model. It's kind of the standard, um, one of the standard files with the model that's available and the output directory to this location. So now we've got an intake version as well of this. Okay, so now we're going to get to the point where we run inference. This will be familiar to you from the classification um, tutorial. So we're setting the paths to the input video for this cars um, uh, MP4. Um, we're going to set the maximum number of input requests for CPU in async to two, um, to four um, here, and four uh, for NCS2. And then we're going to use so we're going to use multiple pieces of hardware here. So we're going to use CPU, 
we're going to use GPU, we're going to use uh, um, NCS2s that are in the cloud, and uh, HDLR, a uh, high-density deep learning card as well. So print out, okay, this is what we've set it to. We're going to create the link to the, the video here. And print out and display the, the video. So you can see now, this is the video that we're using. Um, no bounding boxes. This is just the video before any inference was applied. Uh, so you can see cars coming up over the hill. Um, at one point in this video, you'll see uh, a motorcycle. Um, okay, so some additional um, text and, and instruction. There's a, a optional adjustments that you can do on like the frame rate and the size of the video as well. Um, we're for the interest of time going to keep going. So now we get to the point where we want to create a job. So jobs are this concept of doing the inference to the edge nodes, all the edge equipment that's in in the the um, the dev cloud. The first tutorial that we showed you was the open CV. The second one we showed you was classification. The classification was running on the um, the main uh, development hub just on a Xeon, but this is going to show you essentially you create a job, um, setting up an output directory, specifying the device, specifying the 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 precision FP32 or FP16 or Int8, uh, what the input file is in the video essentially, and the number of requests. Okay, so now what we've done here is we have a object detection job. It's a script and it's building in the inference here. And so for the interest of time, we've already shown you how to build and do the inference through the API layers. Um, but what this has done is we've set up the parameters for the video file to come in, the device, uh, the, the, uh, um, the frame, uh, the precision and so forth. Now we're gonna submit a job and you do this through the Q sub command. The Q sub sub command is you select the job file, uh, the job name, the node is the device that you wanna send it to. And the node number is on the list of devices uh, on the configuration of the, of the homepage in uh, the, the, when I go back to, to this build tab, I know it was on. Sorry, it was on the learn tab. Nope, I forgot. It's on the home tab. See all the hardware configurations. I think I timed out. on the home tab and all the hardware configurations. Um, you can see the group IDs. Okay. You can also query um, using the, and see what nodes are available. So with the, the, the PSB nodes, uh, essentially grab and print out what those are. So essentially this is also a way to find out um, what systems are available. So you can see there's like 15 um, with the group node of this. Um, it's got the latest version of OpenVINO. It's an Intel Core i5 6500TE SKU, which includes integrated GPU, Intel HD 530 and eight gigs uh, of RAM. No, so this one, the second one here, I'm not going to go through them all, obviously, but this one includes uh, a Myriad X um, with eight uh, VPUs on it as well. So those are all sort of the different um, uh, nodes that are available to run. Okay, so now we're going to submit 
uh, a, a job. So we set up our job core um, with our node here uh, as well. Um, we're using uh, the CPU and FP32. And now it's starting to print out progress. And we're doing this on um, this node, but I'm gonna do multiples of them and get them started. So here's one with uh, CPU, I'm sorry, with a Xeon Gold CPU. And this is gonna run inference on that cars video on all these different ones. And then eventually we'll compare the results. This one's an Intel Core uh, with integrated GPU. Job node specified here. And then we're gonna do just on the neural compute stick. And this will take a few minutes to run, depending on how many people are on the on the dev cloud. Because like it's a queue, so you it's a you know, there are finite resources and you may have to um, wait for your inference to be run. Now we're gonna also just set up we could monitor the job status. And so here we're we're seeing all the all the jobs that we um, started, they've not uh, reporting starting yet uh, or finishing. Um, I think that very first one. So we can see the processing has started here. We're starting to get inference actually on the Xeon E3. as well on this particular one. Okay, so while we wait for that to kind of um, finish, I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions. Nothing right now. Okay, now, for this one, we can enter a list of compromised users Okay, um, I'm going to go over to my slides because that's going to take a few minutes to go through. So there's also a bunch of demos um, and reference implementations. Um, so we have demos for, you know, you can see some are Python and some are C++. Um, these are all on GitHub, so you can see these links. We're going to send out this file to make sure that you have um, all these links because uh, obviously you can't. Do it from here, and then we'll also, um, I'm going to talk about the OpenVINO Jupyter Notebooks. So let's go over to Jupyter Notebooks while we wait for that to run. So if you Googled um, Intel OpenVINO Jupyter Notebooks, you will find our Jupyter Notebooks. And in here, let's see here. Finished. It'll tell you what the, the OSs that are supported. So it gives you installation instructions for Windows, um, you know, Ubuntu, Mac, Red Hat, and so forth. Um, I will warn you, Mac does require a, a certain version of Mac, and it may work on newer versions, but um, older Macs had Intel um, CPUs in them with integrated GPUs, and newer Macs, of course, um, Apple's moved to M1 and M2. But in here, we have a number of Jupyter Notebooks that you can try out, so it's like mono depth and object detection uh, and so forth. Um, it'll tell you what the system requirements are. Um, uh, so there's a couple of, of dependencies that OpenVINO needs. So let's talk about what those dependencies are on running them. Um, let's select an OS. Now, this is the way to locally run. Um, now, one dependency is Python, and the other, you also need, in this case, because we're installing from Git, you'll need to uh, do Git, and then you'll also need to install um, uh, Microsoft Visual C++. So you can go through these uh, installation instructions. They are pretty quick. Um, this is just, if I press this, it would download, and you'll go, go through. Just make sure that you check your box um, 
for the path uh, to add Python to your path. You'll download uh, the Git, um, which is a very easy, again, you click the link, it downloads. Um, then you need to install uh, Microsoft Visual C++. That takes a, a little bit longer. It may take about five, uh, ten minutes to install that. Um, and then you can install these uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So by doing so, after you've installed those things, you can start a command line window. So in this case, you know, I would be like, I want to set up my Python environment. And now my window is gone. There it is. And simply you can copy and paste that. Okay, it's, now I'm going to activate my environment. Then you would clone the Git. Um, I've already cloned the Git, so I don't need to do that. It'll take about three minutes um, to actually clone the Git. And then there'll be an available directory to you, uh, OpenVINO Notebooks. Um. Okay, let's see what's in here. So you clone the Git, you know, you've got your all your license files and your make file and, you know, readmes and stuff like that. Um, now a little bit further down, um, you can run these two commands to install um, from pip. And because I think I've already installed, I'm not actually going to do that. So you would install the requirements as well. Uh, install the the virtual um, kernel um, with this command, and then you can launch a Jupyter Notebook. And the commands here to do that, so there's multiple Jupyter Notebooks, and I'll go back to show you that, but it's Jupyter, the notebook, and then the essentially where the notebook lives uh, uh, and the, you know, the, the Jupyter Notebook itself. So in here is a directory, notebooks. And you can see there are, I don't know what it is, about 15 or 20 um, Jupyter notebooks. Let me just DR that again. Um, so you can see it starts out with like a hello world, and then there's a Jupyter notebook for open Vino API and so forth. So the, all these ones, ones that, that teach you how to convert from, say, TensorFlow to OpenVINO or PyTorch to Onyx to OpenVINO. Paddle Paddle is another framework. So if you had models from, from that is on Paddle Paddle framework, then you convert it to Onyx and then to OpenVINO. How to use the model tools, like the downloader tool and the converter tool. Um, and so if I opened up and open up the four. I just want to get the... Uh, name of the Jupyter Notebook, it's in here. And then it's Jupyter Notebook. And then print to that. Now it's opening up a Jupyter Notebook, and this is locally running on your own machine. So what this Jupyter Notebook uh, teaches you how to do is run the um, OpenVINO and the Open Model Zoo tools. So the downloader tool and the command, the converter, you can dump the info about it and the benchmarker tool. 
And so each of these is also um, executable code uh, that you can run. You know, setting the configurations. So it downloaded um, and it's going to do, it's going to instantiate the core, IE core, and so forth. So, yeah. Um, let's see, actually. Uh, let's go back and check and see how our object detection is run. Okay, they look to all. There's a one that's sort of left. This particular mode uh, node must be popular. Yep, they're all look like they've completed. Stats are completed. All right, so now we're going to view the results. Re review, uh, view the results on hmm, CBO. Oh, I think that's the one that didn't complete. Yeah, here we go. That first one was still working. So now you can see the results on GPU. And what it's telling you is it's you know, 3,000 um, frames processed in 8.12 seconds. And it's building bounding boxes over like the cars and it's identifying the percentage, like the likelihood of that it is a car. Now, why would we show you this over, you know, multiple pieces of hardware? Well, with your own model, you know, you might want to actually compare these results, which we'll do. So they're all going to look, you know, virtually the same here. But now you want to view and assess the you know, your performance. So in this bit of code, I'll execute it and come back to it. So we've set up our architecture list, um, creating a table, which you'll see in this image down below. We pulled from the stats list. Um, if the job exists, uh, we're gonna print out the stats, you know, the results, um, that the job ID was. Uh, we're gonna plot um, the execution and time of the stats. Um, and then, you know, it's essentially a table. So you can see in this table, the inference time that it took. Just slightly lower. Okay. And these were the systems. This one didn't finish yet, um, but you can see these, the inference time that it took. So now it makes sense that it took the most inference time on Intel Atom. That's our value CPU. Um, it took the least amount of time on this uh, Xeon Gold. Um, a very high-end um, server class uh, CPU. Um, it also did really quickly on this HDDL card. Even though these are, this is a small uh, VPU ASIC, there's eight of them on this card. So that's why it was like compounded effects of, of, of being able to do inference on, on multiple um, devices at once. Our inference uh, engine frames per second is plotted. Um, so better frames per second more in this case, the reverse from the other one is is better. Um, so uh, it processed a lot of frames per second on the Xeon Gold and a lot of frames per second on the HDDL. And we have some telemetry dashboards as a developer um, that you uh, and that was the one that didn't finish. Let's see this one. And this, for each of these devices, now you can see um, the telemetry for the device. So you can see what the frames per second was, what the inference time is. Here was this the application details, uh, milliseconds, inference count time, the, the model that was used. Again, we used the mobile net SSD. 
the number of layers that model has 363. Uh, we use the precision FP32 on here. <clears throat> um, and you can see how the, the CPU usage um, worked. So the sort of the pre-processing and the inference and how much memory we had to use. Um, GPU is not available in this, so that's why there's no no graph. And you can see how the performance of of um, you know temperature, for example, um, average CPU util utilization and memory. And the reason why this is important for our developers is because in some ways the develop dev cloud is it's for you to develop code in, but it's also for you to to test and measure against um, end equipment. And many customers, this is also developed for customers to develop on and then compare results because it this enables them to try on a whole bunch of different equipment before they make their buying decision about, okay, it seems like given my footprint and given the size of my model and I've been able to optimize it, I would be best suited to an Intel Core i5, right? I don't have to spend the money for a Xeon or something like that. Maybe that's too much um, compute performance. So it helps them to, to determine you know what their budget needs to be for their their ultimate end application All right so we've gone over github how am i doing on time because my window is like not showing me my time anymore can you tell me rihanna um it is 10 30 my time so we have about an hour or so i believe Um, I think I have maybe have 30 minutes. Oh, you got it then, 30 minutes. All right. Well, let's continue on. Um, so we showed you the Jupyter Notebooks. Um, again, like resources, community support, we'll get you these slides, but um, you, know, you can use a trained model from our Open Model Zoo um, down here, or you can use your own model uh, and, and develop your own model and train your own models in, in whatever way um, that's available to you, either through a cloud service provider or on your own CPU. Um, installation for OpenVINO comes in another a number of forms. So there's um, YUM and apt repositories, um, uh, PIP. Um, you can do a, a direct download from Intel's website, um, but you can use that Jupyter Notebook um, uh, uh, a GitHub location to do an install. That's a great way. Um, we've got all these demos uh, and, and the additional tools and you can understand performance and how to do performance benchmarking. And of course, you know, you can do a lot of this in the, in the Intel Dev Cloud. Um, our deep learning workbench um, is a GUI based tool that helps you compare the, the models and performance and the, and the sort of the accuracy of, of pre model optimization to post model optimization. We have all these reference implementations for real life use cases. Um, if you're doing a project for school, this could be a great place to mine um, for projects and reapply, maybe train your own model and, and uh, apply it to some of the code in these reference uh, implementations. Um, and then of course support, we have a community forum. Um, you can engage with us on Stack Overflow. Um, we've got our documentation site um, and we do have training and we have a certification program. I think that's my next slide. So for anybody who's interested in becoming um, Intel certified as an edge AI developer, uh, we have a certification program. It is free to take all the courses, but it's $99 to acquire the badge and the badge is good for one year. Uh, it may be, say you're a, a senior and you're graduating soon. Um, it may be something great to put on your um, resume um, to say you've got this experience. Um, you'll learn um, about OpenVINO. Um, you'll learn um, through Jupyter Notebooks. Um, great way to upskill. And there's also some fun built into it. So it's got sort of rewide, uh, rewards. Um, so there's tips. You can um, earn tips and it's redeemable. Um, as a student, we also have a project a website called Intel DevMesh for Intel community projects. Um, these are, are not only Intel employees, but many people in the community um, who are working with Intel technology. Many of them want to become influencers or evangelists, um, and they will publish projects there. Um, I encourage you as students, particularly, um, you know, work on a project. If you've done something um, that could be an asset to your resume, 
document the project somewhere. And DevMess is a great place to do that in conjunction with GitHub. I would say post your code on GitHub. That'll show employers that you know, you've know you really got some technical skills, you know how to navigate GitHub. Um, and the DevMess site can be a way for you to demonstrate, I used Intel's technology in this way, sort of describe um, what it is. And I'll, I'll go there in a second. Then we also have our Intel Student Ambassador Program. So if you'd like to become an ambassador for Intel, uh, you can um, register with the Intel Student Ambassador Program. Um, you get access to free software tools uh, and libraries. Um, again, direct access to Intel Dev Cloud. Um, uh, sometimes you'll get um, early access to information, um, so NDA information of what's coming up. Um, let's go over to Intel DevMess. Show you that. Uh, it is devmess.intel.com. And these are projects for all sorts of Intel technology. Um, so if I went up to the projects page, you can see like the AI ones, the cloud, gaming <laughs> development, uh, and so forth. But if I went to artificial intelligence, um, you can see um, people in the community have posted um, projects here. They typically post with a little image, a header image, and, a, and you know their name and the, the title of it. Um, this one here, let's see, let's see if I can find one that, may use open vino i would bet this one does so they describe the project as under development they're using uh, both one api and open vino uh, and our mldl frameworks um, they give a sort of an overview of it and the the approach um, the technologies used uh, and you know what they're trying to do is detect whether somebody's wearing their PPE. Um, so that's what Dev Mesh is. And um, the uh, Intel Developer Zone um, is our sort of jumping off point for everything that you want to find at Intel for developers. And if you go to software.intel.com, that is the Intel developer zone. And then a slash IoT on that gets you to the IoT section. So we have the, again, the reference implementations that um, you'll find the software that's downloadable. Um, you'll find development kits of hardware if you're interested in, in acquiring hardware, um, how to learn, how to collaborate, the forums uh, as well. So, if you're ready to get started, again, if you did not register for DevCloud, I encourage you to do so. It's free to access um, for 120 days, and you can request an extension. Um, you can directly download OpenVINO or try out this Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and, you know, the Jupyter Notebooks will help you get going, um, start learning how to download um, models, uh, how to navigate models, uh, and so forth. Um, I do like to point out that there's a very large growing list of companies that are using OpenVINO. Um, and the reason why I point this out is this is a growing industry that needs talent. Um, these are our partners. These are our customers who need employees. So, you know, when you think about as you're approaching uh, graduating from college, um, think about if you're thinking about like a company like Intel, you can look at um, Intel's customers uh, of, of who, you know, deploys with Intel technology. This would be very similar to, to other companies as well, to see who's in their ecosystem. It's a great way to sort of figure out um, potential um, companies you might want to uh, work with. Not just the biggies, but even, you know, really small, nimble ones if you're looking for startups or mid-level size. So, um, you know, hopefully together, you know, we can reimagine how the world and data um, can change our world for the better. Um, I think with that, I've got about 15 minutes and we can do Q&A. I can go back to reshow something. Um, I know we had a question earlier that I, I don't know, I'm not sure if you answered it. I had to hop off for a little bit, but um, it was, what's it like working at Intel? Yeah, great question. Um, it's been great. Um, I've been here for a number of years. Um, I've worked, so Intel is, is a large company, right? I think it's a, about 120,000 people. It's worldwide. Um, there's very few companies that have the breadth of technologies and the breadth of industries that it sells into. 
Um, of course, we have our traditional, um, uh, you know, laptop, note top, notebook, um, desktop consumer business, and we work with uh, the big companies like Dell and HP and and um, Asus and many others who build notebooks. Um, then we have our cloud business, um, working on cloud technologies. So our our infrastructure is sold into the say the cloud service providers, and our customers are are Microsoft and and AWS and Google and and Facebook and many others. Um, and we have autonomous vehicles. Um, we're working in in a, autonomous vehicles and robots as well. Uh, and then in sort of the edge area in all these industries, we sell into retail and healthcare, uh, manufacturing, uh, industrial use cases, uh, energy, uh, gaming. Um, gaming is a big area for for Intel um, as well. So it's it's a it's a place that if you come to work at Intel. There's a lot of options uh, for you to navigate around and get different experiences. I've worked in embedded, I've worked in network computing, I've worked in automotive. So I've had a lot of experiences. Uh, it's been a good place for me to work. Yeah. There's also some really big changes going on at Intel. Um, and we're uh, expanding um, uh, massively in factory. Um, we're building a new campus in Ohio um, at up to, I think, uh, 100 billion, up to eight factories there. So we call them fabs. Um, we are also now, it was just announced a couple of days ago, a new factory site campus in Germany um, with additional um, campuses for assembly and test and R&D in other parts of Europe. Um, so increasing our scope, but as of right now, we've already been um, global. Uh, Intel's fabs are in Arizona, Oregon, New Mexico, uh, Ireland, and Israel. And then we have assembly test uh, facilities. That's typically where operates the, the wafers are manufactured in the fab. They go to and, and, and get sliced up and diced up and they get tested. Uh, and package, which means they you know, put on the substrate um, uh, that can be um, pinned in or soldered down on a on a motherboard. Uh, and those um, uh, facilities are in uh, Malaysia and uh, China and and other locations. So we've always been a very global company. And if anybody wants to go off mute, by the way, you know, has a great time if you want to ask a question. And I think the other question was just, as you can see here, um, how and when, how and where, excuse me, can we access um, the recordings for today's workshop? We're going to put it on the platform website. So um, the one that you registered through. And then I think we'll also send out the foils, the slides, because it has all the valuable links. Are there internship opportunities, student programs at Intel for computer science juniors, seniors currently attending college? There are. Um, uh, I think it's generally if you were to go to, let's go there, jobs.intel.com. So at jobs.intel.com, you can search um, for um, keywords. Um, our, I know that our talent organization works with um, works with some uh, uh, universities and their campus recruiting, uh, but not all because um, there's so many. Uh, but let's just see. Let's just um, let's just see if there's anything that comes up for intern. Yeah, so software development intern, um, graduate intern, um, jobs are often posted here. You're welcome. Anybody else with a question?
Okay. Well, um, I really thank you all for joining me today. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck on your, you know, your university and your career endeavors. Um, I hope you found this valuable. And um, I think that uh, my colleagues here send out a link to a survey um, for you. And I hope you'll, I hope you'll rate it well and recommend, uh, you know, Intel to your technologies, to, to your um, classmates. Uh, if you're a student, um, do check out DevMesh and consider the student ambassador program. You're welcome. All right, with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, um, Elena. Thank you, Rihanna, for your help today in moderating. Of course. Thanks, Jay. Elena had to jump, by the way. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you.